Hey fam, listen, we just finished service and I need you to know it was a blessing to be in the house of the Lord. Listen, we're still in a series entitled The Pivot and we've been talking for weeks now about how to adjust to divine detour. Today's message was entitled The Inner Pivot. And one of the things that we learned is that before there is an outward pivot, there's got to be an inward pivot or decision made for Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you, listen, do not watch this service by yourself. This is one of those life changing, trajectory shifting, family lifting messages. So do me a favor, get a family member, call a friend, get a coworker on the line as we continue in the series entitled The Pivot. And if you're glad he's coming again, let's put our hands together for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, giving him glory, honor, and praise this afternoon. Friends of mine, we're grateful and thankful. Uh, we're going to, in just a moment, continue our teaching series we've been in for a little over a month now, entitled The Pivot. And we've been talking about what it means to adjust to divine detours. It's been challenging our faith, growing us, making us a little bit uncomfortable and comfortable at the same time. And so we're going to continue a little bit further in that in just a moment. But again, just want to bring a few things to your attention, just reminding you that due to some of our graduation activities, we will not be meeting in person this Wednesday. We'll be meeting exclusively online this coming Wednesday. And then also next Sabbath, we will not be worshiping here, but we'll be joining all of our graduates, all of the parents and family and friends at the Von Braun as we worship collectively, uh, as we celebrate God's goodness to Oakwood at this year's graduation service. And then just a reminder uh, that the memorial service for Sister Ebony Lahing will be tomorrow here at 12 o'clock p.m. And for those who are looking for ways to show love to the family, when you go to the Oakwood University, the Oakwood University website, there's a way that you can give to a scholarship. In fact, there is a QR code coming up. And those gifts that are given go toward helping seniors who need financial assistance graduating uh, get across the line. So it is a wonderful cause that has right now real-time implication. And so if you want to be a blessing, please uh, make a donation uh, to that particular scholarship fund. And so at this time, we want to get ready to go into the Word. Is that all right? And so I want to invite those who are online, our digital disciples, our evangel electronic evangelists. If you're an Apple apostle, even if you're under the Android anointing, you can help as well. You can just go ahead. If you're on Facebook, hit the share button. If you're on YouTube, copy that link and send it to somebody that they might be blessed as well. And so for those who are in the building, do me a favor, stand to your feet as we get ready to go to work today. The book of St. Luke chapter 5. St. Luke chapter 5. And we will begin together at verse 27. St. Luke chapter 5, and we'll begin together at verse 27. Again, we've been talking about the need to pivot, to adjust, to amend plan, plans and path, to adjust to divine detours. And, and I believe that there is a particular type of detour that we need to be prepared to make today. Luke chapter 5 and verse 27. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. amen. Luke chapter 5 and verse 27. The Bible says, and we'll invite those who are in the hallways, if they can kind of begin making their way in as well, so that we can be collectively ready to receive the word. Matthew, Luke 5 and verse 27. The Bible says, after these things, he went out and he saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So he left how much? He left all rose up and followed him. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house. And there were a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And their scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said unto them, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. And I think every sinner ought to rejoice at what I'm about to read. For he says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I'm gonna read for emphasis verse 28. The Bible says, so he left all, rose up, and he followed him. For just a little while, we wanna to talk to you today under the subject, the inner pivot. The inner pivot. Let's pray together. Father, 
Lord, we pray that you would apply unique and rare power to today's service. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will not just fill the physical space, but Lord, may it fill every crevice and contour of the heart, Lord, that we might reach our personal saturation point. And so, Father, I'm praying that in the hearing of the word, that faith will be multiplied exponentially. Lord, would you please hide me in the shadows of the cross, that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone would be heard, and at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. We ask this in the name of him who is altogether lovely. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Let those who believe say together, amen. And amen, you may be seated in the house of the Lord. Again, talking to you today under the subject, the inner pivot, the inner pivot. You know, friends, our text today demonstrates the radical nature of grace, and it shows why legalists will always be offended by it. You see, the first thing our story teaches us is that Jesus calls us while we're still under construction. You see, Christ doesn't just identify with us after we are finished. Jesus identifies with us even while we're still in formation. And I don't think, friends, I can rightly express how hated a tax collector was in this culture. First of all, a tax collector was a reminder to the Jews that they were under the oppressive yoke of the Romans in their time. In addition to this, a tax collector would not just collect what was due unto Caesar, they would pad that amount so that they might enrich themselves. And see, tax collectors operated with this arbitrary autonomy so that there was no recourse against the oppression that they leveled against you. And so understand that those who are tax collectors, in fact, the term publican, some believe that it was somewhat of a slur reserved for Jewish tax collectors who simply worked on behalf of the state to bring oppression to their own people. So that a Jewish tax collector would be seen as an Uncle Tom or Chicken George, a traitor of his own. And so when if you were to have a sliding scale of morality in the day, at that time you would have prostitutes, then you would have murderers, then you would have pedophiles, and at the bottom of the ladder would be tax collectors. In other words, even the murderers look down on tax collectors. And friends, I need you to know that Jesus is not deceived about who Matthew actually is. In other words, he doesn't run into him in the supermarket. He does not bump into him at church. He literally calls Levi while he is in the office collecting taxes. But friends, isn't it absolutely like Jesus to take the most hated and most reviled and most repugnant and most offensive and allow that person from culture to stand next to him. And see, friends, I need you to get that the love of Christ is so immense that do you know that Jesus never becomes ashamed of his children? Let me say it again. See, I need you to know that Jesus loves us so much that no matter what we've done, he never becomes ashamed of us. In fact, friends, man, I am on 10 that he never disowns us. He never shuns us. He never disassociates himself with us. And isn't it crazy that even when we're a little nervous about claiming Jesus, Jesus is still bold about claiming us. In fact, it's kind of trippy to me because sometimes we get a little tentative about claiming Jesus out loud. In fact, some of us won't claim him in public. Some of us are with Jesus on the down low. Uh, uh, Some of us won't tag Jesus on his public page. We're always in his DMs. But the good news for the sinners today is that no matter how stuck on stupid you have been, your Savior still publicly lays claim claim to you and is never ashamed of you. How many of us know a real father is never ashamed of his children? 
In fact, man, I remember when my oldest son was about two or three years old, we would take him to the public library where he would sit down in the reading groups. And I remember as I was getting ready to leave, I got caught by two of these overachieving parents. It was this dude that had a fanny pack on his front. And there was this other uh, Karen in the library. And it's crazy because you know these folk, man, that's always bragging about how their kids read on a fourth grade level when they're three years old. And they're the ones where the kids are playing Mozart in preschool. And it's crazy because I'm talking to them. And you know how when your kids can see you engaged with somebody else, that's when they decide to turn up on the side. And so it's crazy. They're boasting about their kids. And my son is pulling books off the bookshelf. Man, he is writing on the wall. He is laying down all over the floor. And eventually they look down their proverbial nose and say, which child is yours? And it's crazy. I need you to know that I didn't care what they said. I said, the one on the floor, that's the one that belongs to me. In other words, I was not ashamed to claim mine, no matter how he behaved, because my pride is not based upon behavior. It's based upon belonging. Y'all not hearing me today. In other words, Jesus loves you not because of how you behave, but because you belong to him. Are you hearing me today, friends? And see, I need you to get that one of the offensive things about Matthew's call to discipleship is that there is no cooling period that the uh, the, uh, Pharisees are able to see. In other words, once he calls Matthew, Jesus does not sit him down for an indefinite period. He does not make him learn all 27 fundamental beliefs. He does not make him go through a screening period to prove himself worthy. He goes from collecting in the morning to discipling the same evening. He is robbing folk at the start of the day and passing the offering tray at the end of the day. That he starts out the day in wretchedness, but he ends the day in service. And see, friends, the issue is not that the the Pharisees don't believe that he can be transformed. The issue is that they've not seen enough evidence that it is offered. Authentic. And see, this shows the difference between man and God because man looks on the outward appearance. But thank God, Jesus looks at the heart. And see, there are some that can't receive Levi just yet because all of his bad habits haven't fallen off, that he's still got some griminess connected to him, that some of the old ways are still attached to him. And there is somebody that can't receive his testimony because of what he was doing earlier that day. And see, the reason that grace will sometimes be offensive is because of what we know about people. See, sometimes what you know about their uh, distant or maybe even their immediate past makes it sometimes hard to receive where God has them at the present. In fact, there are times where some can't receive somebody in the choir because you saw them at the club two months ago. There are certain people you can't stand to see them up front because they didn't speak to you in the hallway. There are some that you don't like to see them greeting in the hallway because you know how they are at the job. And see, sometimes we see the fallenness of man as hypocrisy in the church, but it's not hypocrisy, it's just grace being at work. See, see, it takes a mature mind to understand that I am not trying to lower the standard. I'm just espousing the power of God's amazing grace. You see, the truth is, friends, that if church life was too sterile, if the church was too perfect, if church folk were too flawless, then it would be intimidating to sinners. In other words, if it operated too perfectly, then guess what? Righteousness would not be unattainable. But see, sometimes God positions you to see somebody's transformation from the very beginning and see it all the way through to the end. And the reason God wants you to see the flaws is so that you know what's possible for you. Y'all not hearing me today. In other words, if you just saw the finished product, you would think that you can never arrive But if you've seen some people start at A and they wind up at F, man, if they can do it, it becomes proof that you can do it. 
Listen, I remember uh, when I first took on my responsibilities here at Breath of Life, man, one of the things that made me anxious is I like talking to a crowd, but I don't really like talking directly to a camera. And it's crazy because I would see my peers in media ministry, they would do these promos and videos and it would be flawless. And I didn't really think I could pull it off until I went over to It Is Written and saw my man John Bradshaw. And when I was with him, what he did was he allowed me to see him go through the process. And so I was able to see him have to take three takes. I was able to see him flub. I was able to see him start over. And I need you to know if all I saw was the video, then it would seem like I can't do it. But once I got to see the process, I said, even old stumbling me can do that. And see, sometimes God positions you where you see them error and you see them flub and you see them have to start over and you see them have to take another take because it's proof that just because you stumble, you ain't by yourself. You have to start over every now and then. And if God can bring it around in them, then God can bring it around in you. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? See, y'all looking at me like I'm crazy today. See, how many of us know when they are looking at a diamond to determine its authenticity, if it seems too perfect, they gonna say this is a fake, it's cubic zirconium, but it is the flaws, y'all not hearing me today. It's the flaws that authenticate that there's been a process of pressure that turned it from coal to a diamond. So guess what? It's the flaws that make it real. And do I have at least seven or eight flawed folk in this room that can thank God for the flaws? Because it is the flaws that authenticate that I've gone through a process I don't want no cubic zirconium Christianity. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? Now, there is a hypocrisy in the church. And the hypocrisy is this. See, when I say God calls people under construction, we all shout it. But see, we only really shout when the grace is being applied to us. <laughs> oh, y'all about to quiet. <laughs> In other words, we feel like our sins deserve grace, but we feel like their sins don't deserve the same grace. Are y'all hearing me today? In other words, we want God to cover our stuff and expose theirs, but see, the offense of grace is that he doesn't just, man, filter the grace to those like you, but he covers all of the multitude of sins so that we can all be liberated through his power. Are you hearing me today, friends? And so I need you to know that church ought to be a place where we hold each other morally accountable. It ought to be a place of correction when we are erring. But guess what? We ought to look at one another through the lenses of divine grace so that if somebody walks by and don't speak to you, don't get mad. Just remember, they under construction. If somebody gets an attitude with you on the road, don't get mad. Just remember they're under construction. If you find out some dirt or information, don't expose it. Just remember they're under construction. And see, I need you to know the good thing about Jesus is that he doesn't wait till we are finished. He calls us while we are still under construction. Second thing that this story teaches us, family, is that sometimes, no, all the time, an outward pivot must be preceded by an inner pivot. Now friends, the story of the calling of Levi, this is one of those texts, Dr. Newborns, when I used to read it, it would get on my nerves because it seemed too clean and mystical. In other words, like this stranger shows up at your office with no context or explanation and says, follow me. And this grown man just leaves everything that he has and begins this pursuit of Jesus. I don't know about y'all, it just didn't work that way for me. In other words, like I was actually nervous. I was like, man, something is wrong with me because my response, man, at one point would have been more like that of the rich young ruler. Oh, I'm the only one. 
than it would have been of Matthew Levi. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And the reason I'm nervous is because, man, man, my journey with Christ, it did not happen with this suddenness and, man, this radical, there, there was conflict and there was a tug and there was a back and forth. It took a while for me to ripen to a place where I could say an unconditional yes to Jesus. Am I preaching to anybody today? But as I looked at the story a little bit closer, I realized that Matthew, man, operates within the same parameters of the rest of humanity. Because the truth is that none of us shift radically. Nobody goes from zero to 60 just like that. Matthew goes through a process that just like we do. In other words, Jesus does not hypnotize Matthew. Jesus plucks Matthew because he is ripe and fully developed fruit. Are y'all with me today, friends? So, so look at this quote here in Desire of Ages, page 272. I want you to give you some background for why the yes was so affirmative and so easy. Uh, Ellen White says here in Desire of Ages, the best book on Jesus ever written, Pharisees, the Pharisees had judged Matthew according to his what? Employment. But Jesus saw in this man a heart open for the reception of truth. Matthew had listened to the Savior's teaching. As the convicting Spirit of God revealed his sinfulness, he longed, did y'all catch this? To seek help from Christ, but was accustomed to the exclusiveness of the rabbis and had no thought that this great teacher would uh, notice him. Did y'all catch this? In other words, I need you to know that Matthew had made an inward pivot before he ever made an outward pivot. In other words, his decision to become a disciple was not reactionary. It was not sudden. This was not impulsive. That there had been something that had been brewing underneath the surface for quite some time that uh, basically allowed him to move into discipleship when the door was open. And see, the reason the Pharisees are messed up is because they see this as his first day. When the truth is, it was just his public day that he made association with Jesus Christ. And so the reason I'm saying this, friends, is that there are times when, guess what? You can't understand everybody's moves. You won't always be able to understand the decisions that folk are making. You won't always from the outside be able to really discern or interpret why it is that they're doing the way that they're doing. But I need you to know, friends of mine, that sometimes before people make an outward pivot, that there has somewhere been an inward pivot for the good or even for the bad. Are y'all with me today, friends? In other words, even when people walk down to the aisle, walk down the aisle during the sermon appeal, they're not responding to the sermon that day. There's been an inner pivot that took place before church even began, and now they're making a public decision. Are y'all hearing me today? So there'll be times where somebody will say, oh, pastor, my child just went crazy and decided one day to wake up and use drugs or have sex or join a gang. No, they didn't wake up that day and decide it. There was already an inward pivot that was somehow overlooked, and now the private pivot has just become public. There are times where somebody will say, well, pastor, man, my wife just lost her mind. She just up and decided to leave and take the kids and leave. I said, no, she didn't make that decision today. No, she made a pivot a long time ago and there were some cries for help that went unheeded and there were some warning signs that went overlooked. In other words, I need you to know that even when somebody leaves the church, they, in other words, they may transfer on one Sabbath, but that decision was made a long time ago. So there are times where the public pivot is simply an outgrowth of what's been brewing underneath. Are y'all hearing me today? And see, one of the reasons you need to have an inner pivot is this. In fact, what I really want to call us to is to just celebrate the principle of private deliberation and reflection. I want to encourage us before we start making outward pivots to make sure that we take time for stillness and prayerfulness to really get our clarity before the presence of God. In other words, I want to encourage some young adult, stop putting all your plans out there on Facebook. 
and learn how to be still before Jesus until that things become clear. I need you to get to a place where you pivot first in the spiritual realm before you begin to pivot publicly in the physical realm. Because one of the things I've learned is that public pivots are temporary if they're not preceded by a private pivot. Are y'all with the pastor today? And see, there's some reasons I need, please, young adults, to hear me on this. There, there's some reasons that you need to have a private pivot first. See, the first reason you need to have an inner pivot is so that inwardly you can count the cost. In other words, before you make that decision publicly, there needs to be a private exploration and meditation on how expensive the tolls are on the road you're about to travel on. And in other words, man, you need to see how expensive it is to be a wife. You, you need to see how costly it's going to be to be a husband. In other words, as hard as you think it is working for the church, you ain't seen viciousness till you start working in the public sector. Uh, if you think it's hard being married, man, multiply that pain times 10 and that's your life after a divorce. And I'm not saying these things to dissuade you or try to turn you around, but what I do need you to do is give enough thought to the decision you're about to make so that you don't walk around acting surprised. Ooh, y'all mad today about the results of certain decisions. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? Like anybody like old enough at an age where this sounds a little bit condescending, where you see certain folk, man, where they're surprised by certain things. Like when the pain to a certain extent was somewhat foreseeable. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So, I mean, we have these young folk, man, walking around talking about, I, I didn't know being a husband was going to be this hard. It's because you didn't count the costs. I didn't know being a wife was going to be this much work. I didn't know being a parent was going to take all that. I didn't realize that relocation was going to come with all of these different factors. I didn't realize that starting my own business was going to require this much faith. And the reason that we're sometimes surprised by the weight and the gravity of the responsibility is because there was no inner deliberation where we could count the cost of the decisions we were about to make. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, friends? Second reason you need to make an inward pivot is so that you can strengthen your inner resolve. How many of us know that when you make some decisions inwardly, that by the time you implement it, that it's going to be questioned outwardly? And see, a part of that inner pivot is taking the time to deliberate so that your will can become like iron so that you can withstand the objections that are destined to come from those who don't recognize where it is that God is leading you. In other words, there's going to be a time where folk are going to question why you start keeping Sabbath. They're going to question why you start coming back to church. They're going to question why you ended the relationship. They're going to question why you decided to go back to school. They're going to question why you decided to do certain things right now. And the truth is that if you don't have any resolve inwardly, guess what? The decision is going to crumble once people begin to scrutinize it publicly. Are you hearing what I'm saying, church? And see, you've got to have enough, man, uh, spiritual conclusions inwardly so that when you make a move in faith, guess what? It can withstand the testings and the question, and you will not be pushed back the way that you came because other folk don't understand where God is leading you. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, friends? And see, I need us to get to a place where you recognize that everybody's not going to understand what it is that you're doing. And I need somebody to hear this. See, the problem is not that you get scrutiny. The problem is that you can't withstand scrutiny. In other words, if your decisions can't withstand some scrutiny, then maybe you shouldn't be making that decision. In other words, the problem is not that there are people that scrutinize what you're doing. The issue is that it's not thought through enough. It is not matured enough. It's not gestated in your soul to where you can articulate it with conviction and force and spiritual direction and clarity. See, there are going to be times where folk don't necessarily agree with the decision. They don't necessarily understand the decision. But when you talk with conviction, at least they'll leave saying, I respect the decision. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? 
And see, friends of mine, you got to get to a place where you have spent such time with God, where you've gotten to a place, man, where you can follow his signs more than you follow people's opinions. See, you got to be more loyal to the signs than you are to group think. Because how many of us know that the culture has got us conformed to group think activity where we literally will follow the group more than we follow instructions? It's crazy. I remember probably literally about four weeks ago, uh, Pastor Nugent and I were in Guyana and, and, and we were traveling back here to, to the U.S. And so as we were on the train there in Miami, getting ready to go to customs, as we are getting to the train, like there is a sign that says customs and, and border information there to the left. But then it's interesting. Do you realize that most people when they're traveling, sometimes they're not looking at the signs, They're just following whoever is in front of them. And it's crazy because as we're getting off the train, the first few people in the train got off and went to the right, even though the sign was pointing them to the left. And so Pastor Nugent and I are looking at each other and saying, the sign is saying go left. And guess what? 30 or 40 people have gotten off and gone right. And we had to make an intentional decision to say, we're not going to follow the crowd, but we're going to follow the signs because that's where our destination is. And it wasn't until we followed the sign that folks stopped following the crowd and start moving in the right direction. And I need five or six folk that say, I'm going to follow God's instruction more than I follow the opinions of people. Third reason, friends of mine, that there's got to be a private pivot is so you don't miss your opportunity. See, remember... Matthew is already convinced. He's already convicted. As a matter of fact, the only thing that Matthew's a little bit nervous about is whether or not he can be accepted by Jesus. Are y'all with me today, friends? In other words, he's not waiting to make a decision. He's a decision that's just waiting on an opportunity. So that Matthew already made it up in his mind what he was going to do. Now the reason you got to make sure that the, the opportunity never precedes the decision is this. Is because if Jesus shows up before he makes the decision and says follow me. Understand that he ain't going to get three weeks to deliberate about whether or not he wants to follow. He's not going to have six weeks to vacillate and decide whether or not he wants to follow Jesus. But because he already made the decision. Guess what? The open door and the opportunity follows him. And say, I need somebody to get to the place where before you pray for open doors, before you pray for opportunity, what you want to do is you want to begin settling yourself in a place of decision. You want to make sure that you are clear and decisive so that you don't start vacillating whenever God opens up the door you've been praying for. See, there are times... Where, where we get impatient and we want the door to open before we make the decision. But I need you to know that you won't even be able to recognize an open door if you're not already fully persuaded about what it is that God wants you to do. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? So Stephen, I'm even seeing this in, in, in premarital counseling. So we got young brothers now who get one on one knee and propose and use counseling to decide whether or not he wants to go through with it. We we got young sisters who will say yes, unsure, and use the engagement period to decide if they're going in the right direction. Do you realize that you gotta already know before you go looking at rings, oh, where y'all at? Before you start looking at dresses, like you need to be, the first thing, you need to be fully persuaded I mean, you're applying for new jobs before you're even sure if you want to leave the old job so that by the time they offer you the job, now you need six weeks to pray about it. And they like, you came and applied at our place of employment. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? You got to get to a place, man, where your mind, uh, you, you got to be made up in your mind about some things. In other words, man, you know, when it comes even down to Jesus Christ, man, I, I, you get a place when you're convicted, you ain't asking for what, what you ought to do. You, you're not asking people their opinion. You're just communicating your intent. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, friends? You got to be decided. 
Listen, I remember by the time I got ready to step to my wife, Gianna, guess what? I wasn't making up my mind. My mind was already made up. Can I get a witness out there? Listen, man, it's crazy, man. I mean, it's crazy. I remember when I was at Andrews, like, man, the apartment where me and my friends live, our house was like the party house. Well, that sounds bad. It was the place of social engagement. Uh, can I get a witness? Hey, amen. <laughs> that sounds better. Uh, I felt y'all judging me for a minute, but I love Jesus. I was trying to do the right thing. And it's crazy because like, man, on the weekend, some of the folk that didn't have apartments would come and they would hang out at our spot. And I need you to know, man, how sure I was about this thing. Like we weren't even talking, but I had gathered my information. Man, I was decided. I was just make, getting ready to make the move. And so I remember a friend of mine came up for the weekend and he wanted to be introduced to some folk. And so, man, before we even got to the house, he asked me about Gianna. And I said, listen, I need you to treat her like the tree of good and evil in the garden. Listen, this was very arrogant. I wouldn't even say what I wanted to do. I said, you can have all the other trees in the garden. But I told him, don't even look at this one. Don't touch it, lest you go die. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> Hey church, and the crazy thing is she didn't even know he was interested. I cut that thing go way back up the mountain. In other words, once I heard from God, guess what, man? I wasn't waiting to make up my mind. I was just waiting on an opportunity to act on what I had already decided to do. Are y'all hearing me today, friends? The Bible says here in verse 28, listen, the Bible says here in Luke 5 and verse 28, stay with the pastor, I'm almost done. The Bible says this, so he left all, rose up, and he followed him. Third thing this teaches is that you can never merge your old life with your new life. All right, this is where I need the Holy Spirit to work. Notice that the Bible says that he has ripened so powerfully inside that because the decision is already made, by the time Jesus shows up and says, follow me, the Bible says that, huh, are y'all awake church? That he leaves all and follows him. In other words, when he begins following Jesus, he don't take no record books with him. He don't take no receipts with him. He doesn't take any of his ill-gotten gain with him into his new journey with Jesus Christ. The Bible says that he leaves everything behind in pursuit of his relationship with Jesus. And see, I need somebody to understand this about conversion. Conversion is not a merger. Conversion is a hostile takeover. It is literally where I place myself under the authority of somebody else. And see, friends of mine, I need us to know the reason that sometimes godliness feels so hard is because we're trying to merge principles that are not compatible. In other words, I need you to know that sometimes godliness is not hard because you're weak. Godliness is hard because you're still conflicted. See, the more decided you become, the actual easier godliness actually is because godliness is not the result of how hard you work or how good you are. It's a reflection of how connected you are to the full tenets of the power of Jesus Christ. See, and that's why Romans 12 says, don't be conformed to this world. But you've got to be transformed by the renewing of your mind so much so that your mind has got to be so renewed, so totally scrubbed and wiped clean like an Apple computer so that you're not trying to merge stuff that is not compatible. In other words, man, there are principles that you've got to leave behind. In other words, when you start walking with Jesus, you got to kind of get away from that old mentality that says, man, I'm going to do evil to those who do evil with me. But no, you got to adopt that new principle that says, I'm not going to overcome evil with evil, but I'm going to overcome evil with good. You, you got to leave behind the old mentality that says, man, if they sin for me, if they come for me, I'm going to guess what? I'm going to sin for them. You got to embrace the principle of knowing that a soft answer turns away wrath. 
You got to recognize that there are going to be certain principles in this world that don't make sense in the earthly, but understand that our citizenship is not here, but I've applied for a visa beyond the sky. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, friends? You got to realize that sometimes, man, your Sabbath music ain't going to merge with your Saturday night music. I must tell you the truth. See, we wonder why it's so hard. Why I always take one step forward and three steps back? Why am I high on Sabbath and I'm struggling on Wednesday? Why am I so up and down? Why is there so so much fluctuation? It is not because God is not real or not because God is not able. The reason, man, I struggle is I bring my own conflict because I try to plant things that are not compatible in the same soul. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today? Man, man, I think most of us here, we we know artist Sidney, he was a farmer. And one of the things he taught me before he left, he says, listen, pastor, one of the things I'll never do, he says, I'll never plant uh, heirloom or natural corn seeds too close to genetically modified corn seeds. And he says, the reason I'll never fake uh, plant the natural stuff too close to the fake stuff is because of what they call cross-pollination. Because he says, if the pollen from the fake seed gets on the natural seed, he says the natural seed will become converted and it'll take on the texture and the taste and the coloration of the genetically modified seed. So I can't even plant them that close together. And the reason that we sometimes struggle is because there's spiritual cross-pollination taking place on the inside of the soul because we've been born of the natural seed of the word of God but we are planting the seeds of this corruptible life and there is cross-pollination taking place and even though we've been born of the spirit we taste like the world and look like the world and act like the world when we just need to root some stuff up out of our lives and see I need you to notice something which I think is very encouraging about the sequence of Matthew leaving all behind. See, it's going to bless somebody. See, I need you to know that leaving all behind was not a prerequisite for becoming a disciple. Leaving all behind was a byproduct of becoming a disciple. Oh, Jesus. I did. <laughs> Listen, if y'all could have saw me in my office this week, Man, y'all have thought something was wrong with that boy. Let me say this again. That leaving all behind was not a prerequisite for following Jesus. It was the byproduct of following Jesus. In other words, he didn't have to leave everything behind in order to become a disciple. See, Jesus called him in the tax office. Jesus called him while he was calling taxes. The same way he calls you when you're in the club. And he calls you when you're in cohabitation. And he calls you knowing you're a gossiper. And he calls you knowing you're no good. He calls you right where you are. See, some of us don't like the language of what I'm saying, but I need you to pay attention to the result. In other words, he does not make leaving all behind a prerequisite for salvation. The power to proceed, the power to leave all behind is not applied until he accepts the gift of salvation. See, there are some of us who are afraid to say yes to Jesus Christ because we don't feel like we are ready enough. See, there are some of us that are walking around under this old paradigm that feels like, man, I can't say yes to Jesus because I still have this habit and I still have this desire and I still have this struggle and I still have this thing attached to me. And see, there is this uh, operating man thought that says, man, before I say yes to Jesus, I've got to get some things right. I've got to clean some things up. And see, the problem with that approach is we feel like we've got to audition for salvation. See, how many of us understand that in Christ, you don't have to audition? In Christ, you've already been given the part because of the work of Jesus that has been done on our behalf. In other words, friends, I need you to know that the power to leave all behind 
will never precede your decision to follow Christ. It is not until you make the decision to start following that the power to nullify the old life and to mortify the flesh and conquer the old desires that doesn't precede the decision, it follows the decision. And see, and this is why some of us are messed up because, man, we think that we've got to prove ourselves worthy for salvation. We've got to show ourselves ready to become a follower. I need you to know that you accept Christ wherever the invitation comes. And when the invitation comes, guess what? He cleans you up. He loosens you. He frees you. He sanctifies you. He delivers you. Once you begin the journey of following after him. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, friends? And so the word says here, see, one of the things I want to encourage you to do is, is, see, the reason some of us won't never get free, you won't never get free until you'll get your hands off it. It's, it's just kind of like this. Have you ever been in a situation where there are times where I go out to the house and me and the kids are trying to get in the car and so what they'll do is sometimes they'll, they'll kind of have their hand on the latch of the handle while I'm trying to unlock it at the same time. And you know, as long as you got your hands on it and it's pressing the button, it's not going to open. And what I have to tell them sometimes is get your hands off it. And once you get your hands off it, that's when the door is going to open up and the power is going to be released. And there is somebody spiritually that's got your hand on the door of deliverance. You're trying to pry it open by yourself. And God is saying to somebody, get your hands off the door. Let me unlock it and it will open up for you in time. Are you hearing the word today, friends? And so the word says to us here in verse number 29, the Bible says this, the word says, then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house and there were a great number of tax collectors who sat down with them. Next thing this teaches, friends of mine, is that when you get converted, you condemn your old life, not your old friends. Let me, all right, let me say it again. You condemn the old way, not the old friends. See, you have to lay aside habits and customs and ideologies and thoughts. But guess what? You may have to put some space between you and some old friends. But guess what? You don't condemn those old friends. See, some of us get nervous when I say, man, Jesus didn't make him have a cooling period before he could get uh, active in the discipleship journey. See, there's a reason that Jesus didn't sit him down for nine to 12 months is because if Jesus sits him down, guess to cool him off, guess what? Not only will his, uh, his convictions cool off, his connections would cool off. Not only would it freeze his convictions, it would freeze his connections with those who needed to know the same Jesus. Do you realize that the most evangelistically fertile people in the church are those that have recently made a decision for Jesus Christ? Notice that as soon as Matthew gets called, he throws a party that same night and his former support system, he becomes a pipeline for Jesus to get to them and he becomes the pipeline through which they are able to get to Jesus. And see, and this is why when you come out of the way, you don't condemn those who are where you used to be. You've got a responsibility to be a pipeline. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying, church? A pipeline through which you bring Jesus to them and you become the pipeline through which they are able to get to Jesus. And the truth is that all of us are coming out of some community. So it doesn't matter what it is. If you come out of the drug community, guess what? You condemn the habit, but you don't condemn the addicts. You become a pipeline through which they come to Jesus and you become the pipeline that takes Jesus to them. If you've come out of depression, you become the pipeline to other depressed people and then you take other depressed people to Jesus. Maybe you've come out of Phariseeism and self-righteousness. Don't condemn those folk. You become the pipeline that takes Jesus to them and you bring Jesus back in their direction. Whatever community you emerge from, 
You become the nexus point, the access point that helps them come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying today, friends? And see, one of the reasons you got to be a pipeline is at some point you are a participant. In other words, you can't start judging folk that you used to get down with. No, you were a participant. So now you got to be a pipeline that helps them come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in the same way that you have. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, friends? Last thing this teaches us, friends, is that the Bible says, man, Jesus made this clear. He says, man, they were like, man, why, why he be sitting down with tax collectors and sinners? I love what Jesus says. He says, the whole have no need of a physician. He says, I came to seek and save what was lost. And you know what this says, friends of mine? This is why those who've grown up in church their whole life or who've been in church for a long time, and we talked about this a couple of Wednesday nights ago, should never be jealous of those who are not persuaded. Okay. I need you to know that if you are in Christ, if you've been in Christ a long time, I need you to get that you're already winning. Okay, I need to let this settle in. If you're in the truth, you don't need to covet those who are not in the way. You're already winning. That's why Jesus says, the whole have no need of a physician. He says, I came to seek and save the lost so that they can get where the persuaded already are. And see, the reason I'm saying this is because sometimes we look at this text and we make the faulty assumption that somehow God, man, man prefers the sinner above those who already belong to him. I need you to know that he is not preferring them above you. He's saying, I got to get them where you already are. I want them to have the rights and privileges of a disciple that sometimes we take it uh, for granted each and every day. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying, friends? So that's why one of the stories that trips me out is the story of the prodigal son. So that man, when the other brother uh, sees the father throwing a party and killing the fatted calf for the younger son, man, he gets mad. He gets all in his feelings and gets jealous. And the father's like, son, you eat calf with me every day. Man, we had stewed calf. We had fricasseed calf. Man, we had baked calf. We had fried calf. Man, you have it every day. But guess what? You've gotten so used to it that sometimes you don't even appreciate it. So that guess what? Man, he shouldn't be jealous of the prodigal son because when the prodigal son comes home, man, all he realizes is what he missed out on in the far country every day. He wished that he had never left home. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, friends? And what I need some young adult today to understand is that, man, you're looking out in this world and you think you're missing out on something. I need you to know that you ain't missing out on nothing but the hells, heartbreak, horrors, and the slavish bands of iniquity. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying today, friends? See, man, sometimes we only glorify one half of the testimonies in church. So that when somebody comes in out of the world, man, when we get excited, man, when that person testifies, man, I praise God, they were shooting at me and they, the bullet didn't hit me. I praise God that the bullet missed. But you know what you can praise God for? If you ain't never been shot at. Well, y'all, y'all not hear me today. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying? No, no, praise God that you join Pathfinders instead of having to join a gang. Oh, wait, wait to persuade it at today. Man, man, sometimes married men, you get jealous because you see that other man juggling three women. The reason he juggling three women is because he ain't found the right woman. But if you got the right woman, Celebrate the one that God has ordained for you to have. Are y'all hearing me today? I praise God for the person that overcame drugs, but guess what? You ought to praise God if you never ever had that battle to fight. 
praise God for the sister whose pregnancy test came back negative, but you ought to praise God if you didn't have to take that test. Praise God for those that came back home, but praise God if you never left the father's house. Is there anybody that can say like David, goodness and mercy have followed me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying, friends? And so what I'm saying is that if you've been in the church a little while, man, don't start getting jealous of your old life. Man, because some of y'all trip me out, man. When y'all talk about your old life, y'all sound like y'all had more fun then than y'all having right now. I need you to know, man, that, man, when I started serving Jesus, it didn't take away my joy. When I started serving Jesus, it added to my joy. It completed my joy. It made my joy. For, do I have at least seven or eight folk that can say Jesus is the best thing that's ever happened to me? Man, there is somebody that's saying, Lord, I thank you that I've been healed. But somebody can say, thank you that I've been whole because I've been walking in the ways of the Lord for quite some time. I thank God that because you walk with him, you've been blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. Somebody saying, Lord, I thank you that you restored the years that the locust stole away. But somebody can say, I praise God that he rebuked the devourer for my sake. And I was able to walk in his mercy and in his divine grace. And what I'm saying is, no matter how God brought you here, don't look on them, down on them because their path was different. Just thank God that we all made it here by the grace of the almighty God. And see, I need somebody to know that no matter what your path was, so maybe some of us got delivered from street life, world life, and then maybe some of us just got delivered from lukewarm Adventist apathy. Some of us got delivered from Phariseeism. Listen, don't matter what you got delivered from, praise God that you have been delivered because the crazy thing about it is when Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost, the Pharisees thought he was talking about the tax collectors. No, he was talking about them. Because you realize that there are no tiers of saved. There are no, there's no hierarchy of salvation. And the reason there's no hierarchy of salvation is because there's no hierarchy of sin. Because you know, we, in our mind, we, we kind of have a, a, a hierarchy. So we can tell our little white lies. We can do our little church gossip. Oh, y'all quiet. Because they're, they're, they're a group of socially acceptable church sins. Oh, we can talk about, oh, how you know, I struggle with a little pride. The Bible says pride is an abomination. <laughs> but all them big sins. They really need grace. And do you realize that even when Jesus died, he didn't parse out his salvation and apply more blood. He didn't apply more blood to the crackhead than he did to the gossiper. He made one sacrifice and he evenly distributed it to all people. So there are some who think, man, those other folk have more of a testimony than I do because they were more lost than I was. No, because the prodigal son went outside of the house. But guess what? The lost coin got lost inside of the house. It doesn't matter where you get lost. All of us ought to celebrate the fact that we've been found by Jesus Christ that he thought you were worth saving, that he thought I was worth saving, and that while before the foundations of the earth were laid, he still made the decision toward us before we ever made a decision toward him. How many of us believe the word of God today? So right now, they're gonna to minister to us in song, and then I'm gonna come back and give some final instructions and give somebody an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ today. Was so grateful. You thought I was worth saving, so you came and changed my life. You thought I was worth keeping, 
So you cleaned me up inside You thought I was to die for So you sacrificed your life So I could be free So I could be whole So I could tell everyone I know We bless your name So you came So you clean me up inside You thought I was to die Right now, church is standing to its feet. Just want to say a brief prayer before I make this appeal. Father, there is someone, they've made the inner pivot. You've reached out to them in the secret place. You've ripened them. Help them to come to the final moments of resolve. And Lord, may that private pivot strengthen them to make a public pivot away from the old life into newness of life.
For the past 49 years, Breath of Life has been presenting the gospel of Jesus Christ from a contemporary urban perspective. In 2023, we plan to grow our reach and your donations are what help make that possible. This year, our major goal is to launch our Breath of Life weekly broadcast into five new cities. In addition, we're excited to introduce our new Breath of Life Kids platform with original content created with your little ones in mind. We'll continue with innovative programming, dynamic preaching, and sharing the gospel through evangelistic campaigns. Here are the five ways that you can give. You can give online at breathoflife.tv, by mail at P.O. Box 5960, Huntsville, Alabama, 35814, by phone at area code 256-929-6460, or by texting the phrase, give the number two, B-O-L-T-V, to 1-888-364-GIVE, or by cash app at dollar sign, Breath of Life TV. Every single dollar you give goes right back into the ministry and allows us to share the good news of Jesus Christ all over the world. We pray that God's favor will overtake you as a result of your generous gifts to Breath of Life. God bless you.